Welcome back. In this video, we start a new chapter, chapter three on the mean value theorem. And there will be six sections in this chapter. And in this video, we are going to cover the first part of section 3.1, which could be a little bit lengthy. And then we'll move to other sections. So let us recall first the classical version of the mean value theorem or the calculus version that you studied in the first year. I will call it the version 1.0 of the mean value theorem. Okay, it states the following. If you have a function from a closed interval to AB a, into R, which is continuous on the closed interval, but differentiable in, on the interior of AB, so on the open interval AB, then there exists a number C between A and B strictly, such that F of B minus F of A is equal to F prime of C times B minus A. Now, note that we don't require uh, the existence of left and right derivatives at A and B. Okay, so we only need differentiability inside. But we need continuity on the closure of the, so on the closed interval AB. And there is a beautiful geometric interpretation of this result. So when I divide by B minus A, the geometric interpretation is that there is a point C inside the interval where the tangent is parallel to the chord joining AFA to BFB. Yes, you can, draw, you can draw a figure if you like. And usually uh, this theorem is proved by uh, or can be deduced from Rolle's theorem, which states that under the same assumptions, if f has a maximum, a local maximum or a local minimum at, at a point x0, then the derivative vanishes there. Okay, so we can apply Rolle's theorem to an auxiliary function. Okay, now don't confuse the mean value theorem, which is known in French as Théorème des Accroissements Finis, with the intermediate value theorem, Théorème des Valeurs Intermédiaires. Uh, the intermediate value theorem that you studied in calculus probably states that if f is continuous on a closed interval AB, and R is a number between f of A and f of B, then there exists a number C in AB such that f of C equal R. So otherwise stated, in words if you like, a continuous function on an interval takes any value between uh, the images of the endpoints. Okay, so they are totally different. Uh, the intermediate value theorem is basically a topological theorem on connectedness and continuity. Whereas the mean value theorem is a theorem of calculus or of analysis. Okay, now, as we said in the beginning and in the introduction of the course, we would like to generalize this uh, theorem uh, to functions defined between Banach spaces or norm spaces. Now, in this form, it cannot be extended. Folks, this is not so this theorem does not hold in this form if we consider a function from a subset of a normal space into another normal space. So let me give an example. Consider the function defined on the interval 0 to pi. Actually, it's defined on the whole line and takes values in R2. So it has two components, cosine t and sine t. Okay, so it's periodic. It's 2 pi period. So suppose that there exists a number between Z, C, between 0 and 2 pi, such that f of 2 pi minus f of 0 equal to f prime of C times 2 pi. By periodicity, the left-hand side is 0, 0, 0. Okay? And the derivative of f is just the derivative of each component, so it's minus sine cosine. So if the intermediate value theorem holds in this form, we'll get 0, 0 equal minus sine c cosine c times 2 pi. And this implies that both cosine c and sine c are 0. But of course, this, this, can, this is impossible because cosine squared plus sine squared equal to 1. So they cannot vanish at the same time. 
So this proves that uh, the classical version of the mean value theorem does not hold. And, and <clears throat> here's a challenging exercise. We can show that if we have two norm spaces, E and F, with dimension of F at least two, and of course, dimension of E is at least one. I'll tell you what, why this is. Yeah, so then there exists a differentiable function from E to F that does not satisfy the classical mean value theorem. So you have just to put this example in a larger context. Okay, but if you do carefully the proof, you will encounter some deep facts in the analysis. So this is why I call it a challenging exercise. So it's optional, of course. Okay, so what happens if dimension of e equals zero? I want to think. I want you to think about this question. And in in all our examples so far, we assumed implicitly that dimension of e is at least one, cannot be zero, because when dimension of e equals zero, then e is reduced only to a the origin zero. And in this case, there's only one function from e to f to any f, which is the zero function. Okay, so this extreme case is not at all interesting. So, of course, the zero function is differentiable. Okay, but this is an extreme case which is not interesting at all. Okay, now, however, not everything is lost. Why? Because first, we'll show that the mean value theorem holds for functions defined on an open subset of a normal space and they take values in R. Okay, so when the dimension of the target space is one, this this is this would be our first extension of the mean value theorem, and the next extension will be obtained by modifying a little bit the form of the mean value theorem. Okay, and this is what we are going to do. So first extension, <coughs> we have to, in order to state the first. Uh, extension, we have to generalize properly the notion of an interval of R. And here we have two, uh, two paths. Because an interval of R is both convex and connected. Okay, So in R, the two notions coincide. But as you know, in higher dimensional uh, norm spaces, it's not true. So we have two ways. So again, there is the convexity notion and there is the connectedness notion. Okay. In this video, I'm going to talk only about convexity. And in the next video or in the next section, I will talk about the more general concept of connectedness. Okay. So let us revisit the notion of connectedness, of convexity. We have first to uh, define the notion of a straight line segment joining two points in a norm space, A and B. By definition, the straight line segment joining A, a to B, or the straight line segment with endpoints A and B, is by definition the set of all convex combinations of A and B, if you like. So it's a particular case of a linear combination. So we multiply A by a positive number and B by a positive number, but the sum should be equal to 1. So this is a really particular case of a linear combination. If I want the whole line, then I don't have any restriction on t. Okay? So if I don't restrict t to 0, 1, then I get the whole line joining A to B. Okay? So this is the straight line segment joining A to B. Now, the open straight line segment joining A to B is the same thing, but we remove the endpoints. When t equals 0, we are in, at A, and when t equals 1, we are at B. So when I remove 0 and 1, I remove A, B. So this is the open straight line segment joining A to B. Okay, so both these notions are useful. Okay, so here, this is, and of course, when E equal to R, the two definitions coincide. So the, the straight line segment AB in the real line is just the interval AB closed. And so, same thing for the open uh, straight line segment. Okay, so... This is one extension of the notion of interval. And a subset of a norm space uh, is said to be convex if 
whenever we have two points in this set, the whole straight line segment joining them is contained in this set. And of course, you should be familiar with this notion. So this is another way of stating convexity. Or if you like, for every a and every b in u, and for every t between 0 and 1, 1 minus ta plus tb is in u. Okay. So as you said, we'll talk about connectedness and path connectedness in the next section. Now, having said this, we can uh, prove a, a more general version of the mean value theorem, which is applicable to functions defined on an arbitrary normal space and not necessarily an interval of R. So, Consider a function u defined on an open subset of a normal space and that takes values in R. So it's very important here. The, the target space is one dimension because we know if the dimension is two and more, the mean value theorem does not hold. Okay, and then in this case, for any straight line segment A, B in U, there exists a point inside the straight line segment that I call zeta, such that f of b minus f of a is equal to f prime zeta times b minus a. Okay, or if you like, you can replace zeta by minus one minus t zero a plus t zero b, where t zero is between zero and one. Okay, and this is the figure. So if this is u, just to picture it, then so this is a, this is b. The straight, so U is not convex here, but the straight line segment A joining A to B is con totally contained in U, and zeta is somewhere here. Okay, so both the straight line segment and the endpoints are are in U, are inside U. Okay. Now, how do you prove that? You can deduce this form from the classical, from version 1.0. So, uh, let this convex, so denote this convex uh, combination of a and b by gamma of t. Okay, so it's the equation of the straight line segment. So I can rewrite also as in the form a plus t b minus a, same thing. Now, why did I write it in this way? Because, of course, gamma is differentiable and its derivative is just b minus a. Of course, here, gamma prime in principle should be an element. Uh, a linear map from R to E, but as we know from chapter one, we identify this space of linear bounded maps with E. So, so we can, uh, okay, so this is the identification that we do all the time. Now, if we compose F by this path, we get call, call this new function G. So now G is a map from zero, one into R because gamma uh, is a, a, a maps 0, 1 into E and F maps E into R again. So the composition of these two maps is a function from R to R or from 0, 1 to R. And of course, it's differentiable as a composition of differentiable maps. And therefore, I can apply. Actually, it's differentiable not only on the interior of 0, 1. It's, it's differentiable on R because I can extend G to for to every t. <clears throat> Actually, I need to restrict t to 0, 1. Why? Because uh, the, the, the image of gamma should be inside the domain of f. And this is uh, permitted by the assumption that the interval a, b is contained in u. Okay, so I have to restrict uh, so actually, uh, the G is differentiable not only on 0, 1 open, but on 0, 1 closed as well. So there is a right derivative and a left derivative. Okay, so we apply now the classical version of the mean value theorem to G, okay, which is a map from 0, 1 to R. So, <clears throat> but first let us compute G prime. So by the chain rule, G prime is F prime of gamma T times gamma prime. And... We replace gamma prime by b by b minus a, and now I apply version 1.0 to g. So I can write g1 minus g0 equal to g prime of c times 1 minus 0, which is just g prime of c. And now I replace everything by their values. g of 1 is f of gamma of 1, but gamma of 1 
is b. So g of 1 is just f of b, and g of 0 is f of gamma of 0, which is just f of a. And I replace g prime of c by its value. Okay, and that's it. So if we let z to be gamma, gamma of c, so z is in the interval, the open uh, straight line segment AB. Therefore, we get f of b minus f of a equal f prime of z times b minus a. Okay, so this is the first uh, extension of the mean value theorem that I call version 2.0. But there will be a lot more versions. Okay, so... Um, Actually, if you look carefully, we can prove the following version that I call version 2.1. It's a little bit, the assumptions are a little bit different. What do we have here? So we have an open subset of a normal space C as before, but we have, so, but F, the function, is defined on the closure of U, and of course, takes values in R. It's continuous on U bar and differentiable on U. Okay, so because now we don't know what does it mean to be differentiable for a function to be differentiable on a closed set. Okay, I told you that there are some ways, to, but according we, we just define differentiability on an open set. Okay, so f is continuous on your bar and differentiable inside. If the open straight line segment AB is contained in U, then there exists again z uh, on the straight line segment such that, and you have the same conclusion, so f of b minus f of a is. Okay, so it's exactly the same proof as before, but note that the situation is a little bit different, so it's not a corollary, actually, because in version 2.0, both a and b were inside u, whereas here, we allow a and b to be on the boundary. Of course, if a, b is a new, then the closure of a, b, which is this close interval, uh, those straight line segment AB is contained in U bar. Okay, so this is, so <coughs> this version permits to deal with such situation, and zeta is somewhere here, of, of course inside U. Okay? So this is the difference. Okay? We cannot deduce one from the other, but the same proof actually works for both. Okay? Why does it work? Because uh, the image, the, so we take the same gamma, 1 minus TA plus TB. Gamma maps the open interval 0, 1 into the open straight line segment AB, and this is contained in U, and maps the closed interval 0, 1 into the closed straight line segment joining A to B, and of course this is contained in U bar. And you may easily prove that this is actually the closure of this, very easy. Okay? So now we can, we take the same function G equal F of gamma, and now the assumptions tell me that G is continuous on 0, 1 and differentiable inside. Okay. It's differentiable inside because gamma of 0, 1 is contained in U. So the domain, the, so G is differentiable on the open interval 0, 1. And therefore, I can apply the classical uh, mean value theorem to G this time. Okay. And as a consequence, another consequence of 2.0 version 2.0 is the following one that I call version 2.2. If U is open and convex, and F is differentiable on U, then for every, for any two points A, B, and U, there exists a point Z inside the straight line segment joining A to B, such that we have this. So once again, F is real valued. Why this is true? Why this is a corollary of 2.0? Because if U is convex and A and B are in U, then the straight line segment joining A to B is also in U. And therefore, I can apply version 2.0. Okay? And now, before we move to other versions, I think I will stop here in order not to make this video very lengthy, and I'll continue next time. So thank you for your attention.